Okay, I think that's pretty much a, a just a large enough critical mass to get things going. Uh, we have only 50 minutes, so I uh, want to make the best use of our time. Uh, I'll start off with a quick intro as the last uh, participants are uh, onboarding the conversation. Uh, as I just said a few minutes ago to the first participants, we'll be having uh, what I hope will be an open discussion. So I really encourage everybody to, to jump in and voice your opinion on any of the subjects we're going to be discussing. I did send out an introductory email earlier this morning, and it was forwarded to the new participants as well. If uh, you want to check your inbox kind of for the background. Um, and I also say that I'm quite excited to be here. and. Uh, uh, hopefully with all the technical uh, uh, limitations that are enforced on us, things will go smooth. Um, but since this is a kind of a first time for me to do this open discussion with complete strangers, uh, not in the same room, I, I just wanna kind of propose a framework that we're gonna, um, uh, that I think will make the best use of our time. So I'll spend, probably 25 to 30 minutes describing uh, the issue as I see it, of, of uh, this paradox of conflicting narratives or a pluralist narrative and the complexity in, in uh, building a cohesive uh, story um, as, as an industry challenge. And so we'll dive into that subject. And again, if anybody wants to jump in and, and join on the different uh, perspectives on that, it will be great. And I'll give an opportunity for everybody to introduce themselves as well. And then in the last 20 minutes, based on the dynamics we'll be able to uh, generate here, uh, I encourage everybody to tell their story on how they discovered uh, concepts of, of uh, decentralized economy, radical, uh, radical markets, and uh, how those ideas uh, meet their uh, individual story, whether it's through their career, through their life. Um, and uh, I'll use that time also to kind of give my perspective and hopefully we can uh, generate a discussion that will continue onwards beyond this 15-minute uh, workshop um, within the Radical Exchange Forum and, and all uh, other forums um, of uh, the community. So again, thank you everybody for joining me. I think we have everybody's uh, been promoted to panelists, so uh, you can feel free to share your video and just jump in at any point. Um, so, my name is Gilad, I'll start with an introduction. Uh, I'm a musician turned technologist, kind of in a gradual, uh, gradual process uh, over the last uh, decade when uh, I, I kind of transitioned from being only a musician to a phase where I was doing a lot of technical uh, uh, entrepreneurship and te technical development in the music industry. Uh, until uh, I kind of encountered Bitcoin in 2012, which uh, is the first time I encountered concepts of this technical de decentralization. And that kind of blew my mind in terms of the capabilities and the possibilities well beyond finance, uh, sorry, well beyond finance, uh, which got me interested in a project called MasterCoin. If uh, some of you may recall, uh, it's a project that emerged in 2013. Um, with the idea of taking the Bitcoin blockchain and using it to uh, promote distributed consensus way beyond just simple exchange of value, which is the very niche uh, solution that, that Bitcoin uh, was uh, invented for. And as I was following the MasterCoin uh, project, I encountered the Ethereum white paper, which uh, uh, interestingly enough was part of the uh, Vitalik as part of an attempt to uh, assist Colored Coin and Master Coin, which is a uh, parallel project, um, came up with the concept of Ethereum, uh, and I was very much uh, enthusiastic about the potential there, and started the Ethereum meetups in Israel in 2014, and uh, then years later, when Radical Markets came out, uh, for me it was just a continuum on the same on the same concept, which uh, took the idea of decentralization much further beyond not only beyond money, but now beyond tech and and more into the realms of socioeconomics. And I think now, after being kind of involved on and off over the last decade in these uh, uh, 
uh, in this industry through different endeavors and projects. I think that decentralization has probably been uh, a, a common thread throughout my career. I mean, since experiencing first, uh, firsthand the collapse of the music industry by BitTorrent, which is uh, just goes to show the force of decentralization, uh, whether for good or bad, but it's definitely a force of change um, throughout the cryptocurrency environment into today's uh, concepts that are, are, I find very interesting of, of radical reform. Um, that's kind of my background. That's what brings me here. And the point of this panel was to really try and uh, tell you my story as a very specific narrative uh, of how I experienced decentralization as a concept. And I'd, I'd love for anybody else who wants to introduce themselves and tell, tell a background of, of uh, why they came here and what they're interested in exploring. So feel free to, uh, to jump in. I see people are um, um, saying hi in the chat. If anybody wants to introduce themselves, now's a great opportunity, but no pressure. Just let me know if you want to jump in. Jump in. Sure. Um, hi, Grace. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm, um, my, I'm Grace. I actually am in, um, I live in Slovenia. I'm Israeli. And I got involved in this around the Arab Spring when I thought, oh, wow, this is great that they're overthrowing these dictatorships, but I don't really have any great forms of government to recommend. <laughs> and so I thought, well, we need to create something new. And I started, um, kind of a thought process around what I was calling collaborative democracy. And about four years ago, I realized that the blockchain technology had potential to implement the stuff that I had actually written up and I got involved and I've, I've worked with a couple hundred different organizations in the blockchain space um, over the last four years, doing everything from writing white papers to helping them with tokenization. And now I lead um, the DGov network. So we have weekly calls about what would it look like to do decentralization and governance. And we're gonna be organizing the centralized conference where, where we're gonna try these ideas to govern our own commons. So that's me. Awesome. Uh, if you don't mind sharing a link to DGov, if, if it's something that's uh, live online. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's every Wednesday, everybody is welcome. We have a 90 minute conversation on a variety of topics. So yeah, I'll post the link. Fantastic. Yeah, I can use the chat or you can reply back. And, and, yeah, I'll I know put it in the chat. Book. Fantastic. Thank you, Grace. Um, okay, so if nobody else wants to kind of take a chance. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Guto? Uh, Guto, yeah. Uh, my name is Guto and uh, I've been in the, I came in the blockchain space uh, more or less like in 2016 when I started to go uh, look closer to Ethereum was probably my, uh, I, I knew Bitcoin since I think 2013, but I never got much interested. And uh, Ethereum was actually what catch my, my attention in the end, in the end of 2016, I guess, September, 2016 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm Brazilian though, I'm based in Berlin and I've been working with a few blockchain uh, projects uh, and with the organization. So I was part of the, one of the founding members from the Department of Decentralization here in Berlin, uh, where I help them sometimes. I'm not a, Part of the core team, but uh, more like a curious, I'm super curious on uh, governance, you know. and that's it. Cool, thank you very much. Yeah, it's great. I'm happy that it attracted uh, people from, from uh, uh, who are dealing with governance, because I do think eventually narratives are basically the, uh, end up imposing socioeconomic reality, right? And, and governance and policy is extracted from those narratives and, and what is, uh, essentially the common belief. And if we want to change that, it's some pretty intensive hacking we need to go through, right? In, in, in order to change these fundamental uh, belief systems that people are, are so much uh, reliant on in positioning themselves in the world. Um, and I think that that's part of, part of the, the challenge that I, I want to bring up in today's discussion. And I think this issue of conflicting narratives is massively enhanced with today's socioeconomic structures where our attention is constantly being hijacked. And with the, uh, with the way um, simple and repetitive narratives have such a, uh, such a powerful 
um, force on how we perceive reality, um, the, the challenge for us to open up people to think differently becomes, uh, becomes much more difficult. A, because the space is much, much noisier, and B, if, uh, if we're uh, trying to, to change somebody's point of view, um, we need to become part of the system and have kind of a centralized narrative that is very well packaged and marketed, which is uh, contradictory to what we all want to promote, right? So if we think about why central forces flourish in today's uh, economy is because if you have a simple and repetitive message, all of the networks for communication are basically economically modeled to incentivize those messages to be, um, to be uh, imposed on, on the audience. And that's what uh, makes value of the usage of those networks. So if we take, for example, obviously Facebook, which has uh, come to, my, uh, to attention of, on several different talks uh, throughout this conference, um, you, you can argue that they give much more democratization because they give everybody a voice, right? And they give everybody an opportunity to speak their mind. The problem is with the economic structure that allows Facebook to exist is that malevolent players or simply marketers who have the economic incentive to brainwash you to think something, utilize the core value that Facebook created, which is the network over the content, right? So Facebook is saying, we will curate the content that's most relevant to our viewer based on their network and relations and not based on content because we don't want to arbitrate content and we're not a curator. But since that mechanism is so open and uh, available to anybody who's willing to pay for influence, that can be leveraged against our core, uh, oh, sorry, against our, our, uh, 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 the common good and based on those uh, um, ideas or uh, incentives of external players. And I think that as a concept uh, is something that's very hard to, um, uh, to communicate outwards to passive users of these systems. And I think what happened in the last uh, few months with uh, Black Lives Matter and the way the biggest centralized institution which is um, the US government or the White House has been going on head on has actually promoted this issue to a much wider audience. And I think, uh, not, not that it's a healthy process what's going on, but at least it's getting some attention now. And that's something that we all can learn from and, and take advantage of in order to promote our own uh, kind of more pluralist and uh, radical narrative. So uh, kind of that, that's the framework of how I think, why I think narratives and perspective are so important when trying to tell a story or trying to convince people of, of kind of opening their minds and thinking uh, differently about things that, that seem uh, uh, as, you know, just forces of nature that that's how the world works. So I'll just follow suit. And um, so I think if, if uh, we wanna, uh, if we wanna try and uh, summarize the, the the conflict here or the, the paradox is that we all believe that bottom-up chaotic and emergent structures are the, uh, the best way to tell our story because mechanism design will basically impose, uh, impose uh, the outcome, which is against the core beliefs of, uh, uh, of uh, everybody. I think everybody's uh, belief system who, who is part of the blockchain ecosystem or uh, the radical exchange movement and I recently talked to a friend about it, trying to, uh, trying to explain this paradox and how difficult it is. And he's a music engineer. He came up with a really interesting analogy, talking about how microphones were designed back in the 20s. So when microphones uh, uh, have been designed, the main goal is to try and make the membrane as weightless as possible so it doesn't influence the signal. Right, if you want to transfer, just like a narrative that wants to get to the audience and communicate a certain point, you can take the analogy of signals going through a system and you want minimum distortion from the source down to tape. 
And if you hear recordings of Billie Holiday in the 1920s, and when she sings, she almost sounds like a trumpet. And that's because you hear the mechanism of recording because of the brass membrane that recorded the voice. The voice got the characteristics of that membrane. And he was like, oh, so you want to enable the signal to emerge and you want to have as minimum influence on the signal itself. And anytime you, you go into mechanism design and, and try to uh, impose a set of rules or boundaries on how the discussion uh, should take place and how the narrative should evolve, you're basically um, intruding into the natural order of things. So uh, if on one hand, we have a very uh, big challenge because we don't have the means to uh, promote uh, externally uh, uh, the core values and ideals through, through a story that is very well packaged and marketed. And on the other hand, we want to avoid that inherently to keep our systems uh, integrity. That's, that's the paradox that uh, I'm interested in. Uh, that's uh, uh, something that I started writing about and I'll, I'll share at the end this uh, article that I, that I wrote with my perspective. And uh, we'll, we'll have a chance at the end of this talk to kind of go through this thesis and hopefully have some feedback on, on, uh, uh, on my point of view, at least. So I, I think if anybody also wants to, to expand on any of those points, again, feel free to jump in. But uh, I think it would be a good, good time to give a few examples of actually... Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'll try to make my uh, reasoning uh, not, uh, rational and uh, not uh, confusing, but sure. uh, so you're talking about uh, <clears throat> the centralized narrative that, um, <clears throat> that is hard to deal with and uh, uh, needs uh, updating in a sense. Uh, but uh, the main issue remains that the neoliberal uh, mentality is imposing the uh, in individualism uh, values uh, on all of us and uh, uh, really making us believe that those, that's the liberty everyone has to take uh, a stand or have an opinion uh, regarding their uh, integration in society. But uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, the blockchain space it has really not uh, developed any kind of uh, uh, socioeconomic theory because it's doing exactly the same thing. You have exchanges which are, uh, sorry, greedy uh, people, yeah? And you have every kind of um, uh, token and coin which you have to buy into. There's no, uh, there's no such thing as get it for free, start transacting, no transaction fees, yeah? So the whole concept of actually uh, decentralizing the narrative for people, uh, not only, of course, uh, having to deal with the digital divide and the steep learning curve, uh, for uh, gaining access to these systems, uh, uh, not, uh, notwithstanding even understanding them, but uh, the whole focus of uh, the operations of all these diverse uh, communities and uh, companies that deal with the technology, uh, in my view, they're, they're really not contributing to giving, empowering people, uh, giving them emanci emancipation, or uh, in any sense, uh, offering an alternative to governance uh, on uh, uh, on a state uh, uh, national state level, yeah. So uh, the, the the narrative is so defragmented. Uh, of course, uh, what Radical Exchange is doing is uh, 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 very nice, very good, and I understand that the communities are growing and very many people have <clears throat> the competence needed, uh, but. Uh, uh, if, if, if there really is not uh, 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 a global coordinated effort to, to really put a clear agenda with uh, not-for-profit incentives to act upon it, I, I, I can not see how this narrative uh, is not going to remain uh, confused uh, when dealing with the in individualistic need of people to uh, feel that they actually have uh, some power to change the current state of affairs, yeah? Yeah, I think you, you nailed the problem head on, I think, uh, in, in very, very good terminology, because I think that's exactly the point that involving so many narratives, and for example, when you talk about uh, your perspective on the blockchain, 
the whole ICO space and the whole uh, narrative that emerged from there, which is financial incentives to, to uh, decentralize things, is mimicking a lot of the bad ideas that neoliberalism has in, in the old space. And this is definitely something that I think needs to be resolved and is already, I know, I'm not sure if you're following the developments of quadratic funding and uh, so that's already focusing away from how do we make token issuers who give future promises rich today, which is just mimicking the bad models from, from VC financing, which are good in some cases, but have a lot of potential bad in them and shifting gradually to a, how do we fund public goods that are uh, promoting the sustainability of those public goods? And also how do we get the signals from the community on what should be funded? So this uh, is a more, kind of a morphological progress. And I think we're getting in the right direction, but I totally agree with you that we do need to have some global coordination of how to externalize this outwards. Because it's, if it's happening in an internal discussion only, then it's impeding us from expanding our, our goals and really uh, promoting change, not just, okay, we can have DAOs that can govern our own platforms, but how can we influence real policymakers in, in the real world to well, change uh, update the neoliberal agenda? Listen, nobody is stopping you from creating a new world government uh, with the principles you actually want to enforce. Yeah? Anybody can join, you can create new economic markets there's, there's really no regulation or uh, international legislation that is stopping an organization from doing whatever it wants, especially when it comes to creating a new economic market, which is not, not based on uh, the old capital uh, flow, yeah? Yeah, I agree that there's no, glo uh, there's no global regulation, but I think a local regulation is making it harder for people with certain agendas just to open a bank account or register a company. I, I had that problem with, with one of my companies that I tried and we had to change geographies and spend so much money on lawyers, eventually having our CEO resign because saying, listen, listen my, I, I can't work in this changing environment, it's too dynamic. So I think there are still clashes between those narratives and, and uh, again, I don't think that's gonna stop the movement. It's just a matter of, is this gonna be a radical change that happens through failure of systems and then Kind of destruct, destruction that we'll need to rebuild from, or will we be, I don't know if it's lucky or smart or both, of, of being able to develop these collaborative, um, collaborative efforts that will write their own narrative and render old institutions obsolete. And I think that's what radical exchange is, is about. I, I saw Grace and, and uh, Guto, did you, did you want to add in something or? I'm not sure if you raised your hand there. Oh. I was just making like twinkly fingers that I was agreeing with what Cyprian was saying. Okay. Twinkly okay. fingers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that really, really, uh, really has hit on uh, in, in, in what I'm interested in. Not that I have a solution, right? I have an opinion only, and, and it's great to see that other people are also uh, busy with, with thinking about uh, these solutions. So uh, also uh, to be able to kind of visually express how things are changing. Can you see my screen? Oh, this is the wrong screen. New share. Let's try this. Desktop two. Oh yeah, you can see it. Okay. You, can you see this beautiful uh, modern art thing? So this is just an example from a Medium article called Visions of Bitcoin. Uh, and it's just a very, a very nice visual way to, to show how the Sorry, that jumped up. So it's a, a great visual way to show how the narrative and the main concepts of what Bitcoin is have evolved throughout time. And if you think about a newcomer who is trying to wrap his head around these concepts, you can see how confusing these, uh, uh, these issues can be, right? So if you go from e-cash proof of concept to censorship resistant eagle to cheap payment networks to programmable shared databases each of these concepts is something that you need to wrap your head around and if you're not kind of a, a techie it, or, or an economist it's hard to follow right uh, another example that somebody did kind of in a, in a retrospect to to that article is the visions of ether 
that you can see completely new concepts that each one of them needs enough nurturing just to be understood and, and developed. And you can see that here also, there's a very clear mor morphology and things don't stay constant. So that's a challenge both to the builders of these, uh, to, to uh, entrepreneurs building on these technologies, but also to uh, people trying to, to get in. And I think, unfortunately, the ICO boom was such a, uh, the, that specific narrative, which uh, I think is here, uh, Crypto crowdfunding, it's called here. So ICOs and, and STOs, because uh, that attracted a lot of uh, a lot of malevolent players who just um, took advantage of this ecosystem. Uh, it, it kind of caused a backlash to how people perceive and understand um, and cryptocurrencies in general and, and blockchain, uh, blockchain as well. And if you think of it, this is just this is just a uh, blockchain, right? We didn't even uh, talk about uh, ideas of radical exchange, which have been self critiqued by, by the author a year after the book was out. So again, if you, if you, you're not currently in today's narratives and the way they are structured, if you're not a geek who really loves to dwell and, and, and uh, think about these issues in depth, it's very hard to, uh, um, and say to, to enter the space. And I, from my experience working with a web 2.0 veteran who's transitioning to the space, it's, it's, very, it's very clear that from every discussion we have, the deeper we go, the more complex things become. So uh, again, on one hand, it's fascinating. On the other hand, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, but may I ask, so uh, if this uh, should be considered as a natural evolution of uh, the start of the fall of capitalism, which Marx uh, proposed or meant will happen, yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and even uh, uh, Maynard Keynes actually believed would occur. Uh, so uh, where is this heading? Yeah, because you won't be able to create a new society uh, with, this kind, with this kind of level of defragmentation uh, in the whole blockchain sphere. It needs to coalesce to something more, uh, uh, a more clearly understandable unification. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I think that's a, that process can only happen through discussion and open forums, and I think that's part of what's uh, exciting about seeing radical exchange uh, growing. And unfortunately, I believe it's gonna be a long process. I, I believe what we can do is support the process and uh, uh, I don't think, even if there was, you know, pure, pure innocent players, like for example, I know Vitalik, uh, I've known Vitalik for, for uh, the first few years of his working. I really believe if he would become the president of decentralized earth, uh, if you will, uh, I, I would follow him, but there's no chance that with the way information is spread and narratives are being constructed, constructed today, sorry, that some kind of centralized model can ever fish what we're looking for. So I think the best thing we can do, and again, this is just an opinion, uh, I think the best thing we could do is to refresh our approach on how we discuss things outwards and, and create as many think tanks as possible, just like DGov that Grace was talking about and Radical Exchange and local forums. I myself joined my local municipality, I live in a village of 400 families, and I believe we can start experimenting over the next few years uh, in real world problems of local, uh, local funds and, and shared resources, and just apply change through practice, but it has to be bottom up and it's gonna be a long process. So what I propose, for example, is a framework that I call collaborative decentralization, and it has six basic principles. I'll share, I'll share the article with, uh, with everybody after the call. Um, but the first principle is to change the way we describe. And that, that again, everything draws from, from uh, radical exchange concepts, just my own formulation of, of, of these thoughts. So one of them is, the first one I think, and the most important is to, to refresh our approach of how we describe social interaction or cooperation on large scale. And 
Today, I feel like economists are basically uh, more thinking like engineers. They're trying to pick up information and then build the right policies that are like mechanics to, uh, to bookkeep what's going on and to formulate policies around them. And instead of thinking like engineers, I think we should think like ecologists who describe natural systems that are self-organizing and chaotic in nature. And I think economists should kind of take a step back and instead of imposing policy, they should document interactions and policymakers can draw from that. So that's kind of a change of approach it needs to be something we need to be able to formulate together as kind of a, a proposed language. I think it, it comes down to, uh, to building a, a, a uh, language around our shared goals and beliefs. And the second point is I think we should decentralize the, the legislative branch as much as possible. Quadratic voting is an example. But I also think this maximalist decentralization is a bad approach as well. I mean, not everything should be decentralized, right? You have, and that's why things are complicated. We want to have people who uh, are experts in certain opinions to be able to voice their opinion or influence uh, more than others. For example, we should, I, in, in my opinion, change the way we think about uh, accreditation, like accredited investors are basically, are basically uh, defined by their economic, by an economic threshold, but it should be something much more complex that I'm sure if we wrap our head around it, we can, we can uh, update those policies. But, um, the, the whole idea of, of uh, one person, one vote should go beyond quadratic voting and, and think about how we can uh, basically have a shortest route between the signals of, of what people want and, and what their preference and also what is their dislikes and, and what they're afraid of, for example. Uh, they should be able to signal that to the legislative branch much more efficiently than the models that were developed a few hundred years ago. And, uh, and also I'm a big believer in automation. And kind of the third point is that we should automate. If we think about the legislative branch as being much less an idea of House of Representatives and much more a system, uh, a decentralized system, I think the executive branch should be automated as much as possible. And instead of fearing loss of jobs, we should transition into a, uh, into uh, having people spend their time on, on what is more efficient to their local community rather than just keeping their jobs so they can continue to save in their pension and, and continue to sustain the existing model. So the more automation we have on the executive branch, the more, um, the more we can free up people to, to uh, put the resources to where things really matter uh, and, and really affect their, their daily lives. And uh, obviously, the last uh, three points are, are kind of generic uh, to decentralization, but uh, one of them is transparent and open, uh, uh, open system. Um, so having as much access to the processes as possible, whether it's open budgets and, uh, uh, and uh, protocols that are accessible to everybody in the community. And the fifth point is about developing uh, free markets for regulators. So just like in the cryptocurrency space, we have companies who audit, uh, who audit smart contracts because there's no uh, authority, right? It's not like uh, Facebook has checked this app and it's safe for use or Google has checked this add-on and uh, it doesn't have any security breaches. Nobody expects the common user to know, uh, to audit a smart contract, but because uh, we build, uh, because it naturally evolves, you can imagine a marketplace of regulators on all these different processes. If you have open source voting systems and open source um, uh, uh, governance systems, you need to have open source regulatory frameworks to allow for kind of free market dynamics to constantly monitor and regulate the existing structures because that's the only power you have to, for example, avoid something like the ICO fiasco that, in, in, my, in my opinion, that was a fiasco, how quickly 
things became uh, got out of hand. Um, and I think part of that because it was relying on external institutions like Twitter and Facebook. So at some point there were so many fake Vitalik accounts who was giving free ether to people who contribute to different projects that I was surprised in the amount of people who were just gullible enough to follow that. But unfortunately that's the reality is people are much more instinctive based and, and they, uh, than, than rational thinkers when it comes to uh, encountering these new, new ideas. And um, the, the last point is uh, the important part of documenting and indexing what's going on in this, as you say, uh, Cyprian, this fragmented landscape. It, it takes an active, uh, it takes a lot of, sorry, effort to map each and every one of the different projects and movements and understand how they relate to each other because there's no central kind of, you know, directory or, or index of what's going on. I mean, some people call web, call web 3.0, another project called the decentralized web and some call it, uh, and, and, and that gets confused with the cryptocurrencies and radical democracy and radical exchange and abolishing democracy and revenge capitalism. All these concepts have so many overlapping uh, concepts, sorry, all, all of these uh, movements have overlapping concepts, but they can be contradicting uh, when, when you dive into each one independently. And, and that's why I, I totally agree with Cyprian that we need to have some kind of global forum. Maybe it's radical exchange is it, but again, we're going to see how things evolve and, and this could be, you know, hopefully in 10 years we have a think tank here with hundreds of people who are actual policy makers and lawmakers in different countries. And, um, you know, from uh, another discussion I had with somebody older, he said that, uh, said that the generational gap will also be influencing and, and we're, we're going to see much less, uh, uh, much less friction when we have younger um, representatives, just like this uh, guy running for, for Congress right now who's uh, uh, a big fan of, of radical exchange. And I think he, he was also speaking at this conference called Jonathan Herzog. So hopefully in the next few years, this is a process that will evolve, but uh, uh, I think it, it has to be a natural evolving process. The problem is that uh, <clears throat> kids inherit uh, money from their parents and power usually f goes down uh, as legacy. So. Uh, but uh, if you're if you're thinking about the executive branch, I mean, there's planning about how to plan and how to carry <laughs> out uh, official duties in on municipality level, regions, state level, and whatever. And uh, the deep learning uh, machines and artificial intelligence, if it's not going to uh, keep control and <laughs> oversight of everything that's going to happen. It needs to some degree to be built by a central organization, which of course shows uh, publicly that uh, the system has the power to keep the oversight and to dictate the policies by building the organization at every level uh, with deep learning self-referencing. Otherwise, uh, you still have the problem of uh, uh, power distribution and uh, competence uh, allocation, which as you mentioned, it, it needs to continue because of course, uh, knowledge is power and it dictates uh, who governs what and who has the authority and the mandate to do which task in the society. But uh, if, if the legislation needs to be changed and there's no automated way to actually do that, uh, uh, by unifying the competence at every level in society, uh, you, 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 would you will never get to that, to that point anyway, because you will still would, um, from human input. I would think these, I actually think the exact opposite of that and also of the point that you raised earlier about how we have to coordinate better as one uh, group in order to succeed. We're talking about decentralization, the whole idea of biodiversity and ecological systems show us that in order to have working systems, it's not about having one control or one way of doing it or one, like people like 800 pound gorilla. If you go to the jungle, the gorilla doesn't have more power than the ants. 
It's not like that. That's not how sustainable natural ecosystems work. And there's nothing sustainable about complicated solutions to complex problems. And I know Gilad is using them interchangeably. We don't even have two words for complex and, and complicated. But we have systems in place today that are using complicated solutions for complex problems. That's not how our body solves problems. Our body's all made of DNA and cells, but what my heart does and what my lungs do, do is not interchangeable. What is useful in those kinds of natural systems is good senses of communication about, mostly about limits. Most of the forms of currency in our body are, are about um, functions and limits. So what do I do with this input? Like I ate this, now what do I do with it? But also like, it, maybe I should throw up, right? Like maybe it's gonna make me sick. And if I get a fever, that's like systems working together. So mostly um, one of the things that we haven't done appropriately in our society is we've created these money systems that have no limit. Um, and then we have things that even like with carbon credits, it's like cap and trade. You can't cap and trade 24 hours a day. This just cap. In nature, there's just cap. There's no trade. And that's where, why we're having all these problems. So I think that when we talk about decentralization, decentralized networks, there needs to be a protocol, there needs to be a canon, and, and there's a lot of variety in the system. And again, you know, if you happen to belong to the decentralized organization that Gilad and I belong to, then you're a Jew and, and it's decentralized and each little tribe does its own thing and each synagogue, whatever, but we have a canon, we know what the protocol is, we have a certain, you know, like if we need to speak certain languages, there's two languages, three languages you can pick from. But, you know, some people speak one. If you're European, it's different than if you're, you know, there's, there's a protocol and there's a certain variety within the protocol and it all works together. And I don't think that anybody's going to have the right answer. And I don't think there's going to be one movement. I think that there's going to be um, forms of interaction that we agree on in maybe instead of money or in addition to money that are better fundamentals and that are more collective oriented. So it's not the health of me, it's the health of my collective, which might be a city and it might be a neighborhood or it might just be all the people with red hair, whatever it is that I've decided to belong to. And so I think that we're gonna be seeing more variety in governance systems, like that there isn't gonna be one answer. What Gilad is proposing has a lot of things in common with what I'm thinking about, maybe has something in common with what what one of you guys is thinking about, but I actually think that there isn't, that these coordination mechanisms are outdated because they're unable to have the agility of, um, you know, natural systems of the variety of systems that we're going to need and then better regulatory systems. And I don't, and, and not so much legal, but like something that in addition to money caps behaviors of certain groups from imposing on other groups or imposing on society as a whole. I, I, I agree with you and I understand the need for collaboration. Uh, I, I feel the, uh, the time is of essence and we're trying to change systems that have grown for uh, uh, centuries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Capitalism is not something you can take on by yourself. I'm not, I'm not naive. Uh, but uh, the majority of the world population are poor. Yeah? You can try to affect and change society at a, a digital level how much you want. If you're not going to offer the, the starving people without internet access some kind of universal relief, you're not going to change anything. It's going to continue as it is, uh, like... Uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard said about mercantilization, that we're uh, commodifying uh, knowledge. And as long as that continues and somebody makes a profit of any kind of knowledge that is uh, generated, nothing will change. So as absolutely. long as somebody- I absolutely agree. Profit, I agree, that's, that's but that's problem. not gonna come from above. That's gonna come that from is. each one of those communities finding their own solutions. It's not gonna be like some big global entity is gonna distribute food to everybody. That's not what's gonna, you know, like, exactly. that's, that's what's gonna happen if we do nothing, right? They're gonna tell us what health, or health information to do, whether we should wear masks or not. They're gonna give us the food and we'll be 100% dependent on us. That's the world we are going into. I don't think that's what we want. 
No, no, I, I, I agree with you, but it's so easy for governments to regulate the blockchain uh, space. It's very easy for them to say, stop, you're not allowed to do this and this and this. Yeah. yeah. So, you, so you're fighting against time. Yeah. Yeah, but I think if we focus only on blockchain, indeed, there are, there are uh, things that are very limiting when you're only in the digital space. But if you inspire new ideas and new ways of thinking, I think there is a chance for us to inspire communities how to self-govern from the bottom up. And, and not, not saying that it is easy or there is a solution, but I agree with Grace that if we try to formulate a global entity that will... Uh, that will dictate how it should work, then we're setting up ourselves up for failure. I can give one, oh, I see we have only two minutes. I can maybe end on, on, on this note, which is an example of, I think, a process that, that went wrong. This is something that I experienced uh, personally from being in the music industry. Uh, you know, in, uh, the way the music industry was set up was so skewed and asymmetrical uh, until the 90s where music just became a commodity. I mean, you had, huge conglomerates who bought over all of the studios and basically sold plastic, uh, remastering the same edition and capitalizing on intellectual property over and over again, that when BitTorrent came out, it just really abruptly uh, broke down the whole infrastructure of the music industry, which on one hand is a good thing because it wasn't uh, optimal, definitely not for the artists. But unfortunately what happened is that we ended up in a way that today music is, if it was being, a, if a music was a designed, popular music was dictated by a and R representatives back before the 90s, today music, is, uh, music taste is basically dictated by algorithms. And the, if you think of the economic power that drives what music will be popular, you think that in in the 19, uh, sorry, in the 1960s, when the Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel were, uh, you know, corrupting the youth, the parents didn't buy them. So students and, and young, Amer young uh, adults would buy the records and they would dictate what was popular. And then in the 90s, MTV was doing that. And then music became much more based on teenagers uh, and uh, their point of view. And nowadays, toddlers who press repeat on YouTube videos train the algorithms, oh, that's what most people like, so let's feed them more of this and more of this. And we, we ended up with a great ecosystem of independent artists who can directly communicate with their audience, but unfortunately there's no kind of, nobody figured out the economic model to, to sustain that. And on the other hand, kind of popular music is now dictated by algorithms. And this is just a small example, it doesn't, touch governance and it doesn't touch big things, but it, it does show how an industry that was decentralized by force did not restructure itself in a, in a, in a way that really renewed and, and, and liberated the artists who create. And I think that's what's happening now with basic truth, right? Because of what's happening with, with the algorithms that are taking over our narratives. And that's, I think, where we are today. And, and um, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, our time is up, but I think um, this is a fantastic discussion and I hope all of you will continue kind of conversing on these matters. I'll share, I'll send out a, a link. I think I did send to everybody a link to my article. So if you want to read about it, comment on, on it on Medium uh, or email me if you have more interesting concepts uh, to discuss. And I, I want to thank everybody for joining. I see we're going to be kicked out of here pretty soon. Uh, there's uh, another session starting. So thank you very much, everybody. And I really appreciate you chiming in and doing the discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care.